So guys, bank CEOs are now being questioned by the EFCC in the shady games that have been going on in the humanitarian affairs. We all know what has been happening recently. I tell you, bank CEOs are being named in all this corruption allegation. So you can see that the network is huge. The network is huge. And if really we mean to fight corruption in this nation, you will see that Nigeria will suddenly become a very rich country because it's going to be clearer that corruption is what is taking us backward instead of forward. So just listen to Aisha Yusuf as she breaks down all this for you to understand. Because Gazette is reporting that EFCC arrests Zenit, Providos, Jai CEOs over involvement in better Edu Sadia Umar Farouk alleged fraud. And so let me go let me go on and read it. He said the CEOs of Zenith uh, Providos and Jais Banks have been apprehended by the Economic and Financial Crimes Commission, EFCC, in connection with financial misappropriation and fraud linked to a disgraced Minister of Humanitarian Affairs and Poverty Alleviation, Beta Edu, and her prede predecessor, Sadia Umar Farouk. The banking executives who have been under still scrutiny since the public outcry over the unscrupulous diversion of public funds uh, into private accounts are now in EFCC custody. Multiple credible sources within the presidency told People's Gazette on Tuesday. The Antigraft Agency is presently probing numerous instances of substan substantial public funds directed into private accounts and actions, and actions sanctioned by Ms. Edu and Farouk using their position as ministers. Ms. Farouk, who oversaw the Ministry of Humanitarian Affairs, Disaster Management and Social Development under the previous administration, is also under investigation for the mismanagement of at least $37 billion in public funds designated for the conditional cash transfer program of the then President Mohamed Buhari. The large-scale movement of funds into private accounts was partly facilitated by a potential deliberate oversight in flagging suspicious transactions irresponsibility banks bear under various anti-financial crime laws and central bank directives, the sources told the Gazette. The banks did not immediately respond to the Gazette's request for comments regarding their CEO's detention. EFCC spokesman Dele Oyewale sidestepped inquiry into the matter. Meanwhile, Ms. Edu has said her hands are clean and she's committed to fighting corruption amid the uproar over her illegal request to wire funds into a private account. Ms. Edu made this statement in a Facebook post she addressed to NPower uh, beneficiaries. And a whole lot more. Let me just stop there. It's all Nigeria. All sorts of, all sorts of this thing. Of course, banks. Hmm. Well, let's, let's see how this goes. Let's see, let's see what's going to come out. Let's see how it goes. And what... <sighs> you know, the thing for me that really... Sometimes I just think about it. Nigeria is a country where there's so much poverty. People are suffering. People are suffering in Nigeria. You understand? People are really suffering. The basic things in life that human beings need in life, most Nigerians cannot afford them. Most Nigerians cannot afford them. And then you have public funds being wasted, being looted, being stolen brazenly in such manner. What am I even saying? Is it not the stealing, the looting or whatever that brought the poverty that people can't afford these things? Our governor of Kano State, Ibrahim Shakara, is saying, look, it's not just cutting down on the on your entourage. There's a need to also cut down on the number of ministers that you have. Uh, about 48 now, a lot of people actually expect that uh, the Donda Tinubu would have uh, fewer than, you know, in the last administration. Do you agree with that? I'd like you to address that point. And how best do you think President Tinubu can actually sustain this uh, momentum in a way that it will be, uh, you know, it will become uh, the norm? Well, I think we have missed that boat already. Um, it should have been done before. It hasn't been done. Um, I personally think you do not need this amount of ministers. But I understand we have a structural problem. We have a constitution that states that every state needs to have a minister. So that's 36 ministers already. And this president is perhaps the most political president Nigeria has ever had. At least the most political of the First Republic. So he comes with a, he's, he comes with a baggage of a network of political people seeking political appointments. So it's very tough 
to ask him to reduce it. That I get. And um, it's not good for the system because, mind you, the need to have 36 ministers to represent each of the state is something that has to do with how flawed our system is, that we don't trust the system and everybody wants to be inside. And it also tells you the idea of being inside to go and do what? Because, you know, in Nigerian politics, people go in poor, they come out rich um, because they don't trust others to do with it. They, we all want somebody from our own part to be inside there. That's the weakness of, this, of the structure. So that, I think, you know, it, it's, it's gone back. What's he going to do? Start sacking people unless they catch them with their hand in the cooking jar. They can't just wake up and say, go home. We want to re reduce the, the cabinet. That's going to be tough. What can be done, though, is that once you agree that, you know, 48 ministers seems a lot, what can be done is that we need to find a way to make sure that these 48 ministers have 48 achievements. So that each one of them needs to be seen to say, justify your presence here. I think that's what we need to be looking at now. Because if the output can outweigh the input, then the presence, the presence of 48 ministers or more can be justified. That said, it looks, you know, bloated in, in an era of, in 2024, an era of technology and, and light, um, light uh, mechanisms and systems. Well, that, you know, but that's where we are. It's an Nigerian peculiarity <coughs> because everybody has to be inside. What the president and the presidency can do is to make sure each one of them actually achieves something. Uh, on the issue of, you know, what needs to be done now to sustain the momentum and not you know, this situation not just be a, a flash uh, in the pan in terms of reducing the cost yeah. of governance and wastage. Well, I think, you know, in terms of reducing, you, you know, cut, cutting the entourage, cutting the expenses, I think that can be done. But interestingly, whilst I understand the moral demand and the popular angle of asking people to cut wastage, and, and it is true because, for example, the amount that has been budgeted for the health of government, i.e., you know, medical health of government and the National Assembly, the amount that has been budgeted for the library, they, they seem ridiculous, especially, they seem ridiculous standing alone, but they appear very ridiculous when you compare them to what is going on in the rest of the country. You know, they compare the budget of education to the budget of the National Assembly and to the budget of other things. They appear ridiculous. But I am not really for somebody who cuts the input. I am more for the output person. I'm a supply side person. I'd rather we focus on what each person does, you know, than how much we're spending to them. So, left to me, if Nigeria was a company that I manage, an industry, I wouldn't be asking to reduce the number of staff. I'll be asking for each staff to produce more things, gain more market, and, and increase our output. That's what I'll be looking for. And this is a mindset that goes beyond government itself. There are ministries, those who travel Niger across Nigeria, there are parastatals, there are agencies, there are government offices, where people do nothing. You know, they just sit down there. Just even walk into some of our essential services providers, once they're not um, in the eye of the storm. There are people who are just assumed there, and they have, you, you go to their office, and offices, and it, it looks a moribund place. We need to make people productive. We really need to make people productive. And you know, this is Peter Obi's mantra. This is what Peter Obi keep preaching, that Nigeria should move from consumption to production. And I think that is going to help. Because even these ministers, they are just idle. And like you can see, all they know is just to loot, loot, loot. Nobody's bringing any creative ideas to the table. So guys, you can see that corruption is the biggest problem we have in this country. And we can't wait to get rid of it. Let me know what you think about this in the comment section below. Please don't forget to subscribe to the channel and turn on the notification bell. Thank you.